I'm Nan Geschke, your host of the Los Altos History Show. This evening's guest tonight is Eleanor Cameron. Welcome to the History Show, Eleanor. We're so pleased to have you as our guest tonight. Thank you, Nan. It's lovely to be here. Boy, we're so thrilled to have you. Eleanor Cameron has lived a very interesting full life. She's not only, she was raised in this area and she's lived through many changes, not only in her own life, but also in the life of Los Altos. And we're so excited to be able to share with you the very special life of Eleanor Cranston Fowl Cameron. Thank you for coming again, Eleanor. And I know that you, um, are, your roots go back to your grandfather, is that correct? As a, a native daughter of California? Yes, native granddaughter. Great native granddaughter, okay. So what can you tell us about your grandfather? He came out here from Canada on the first transcontinental train uh, in 19, 1870, one year after the Golden Spike was driven from a farm in Canada where his ancestors had come from Scotland. And he came out here, he had hated farming, and so he became a carpenter and, uh, and then gradually began to build wonderful Victorian houses and became known as a leading architect. And I remember when I was a child, my mother taking me on a cable car in San Francisco, past a row of his beautiful Victorians, all different colors, like different s stamps in a row in an album. Oh, wow. Now, I, Eleanor was, was nice enough to uh, lend me her photo album. And I was able to uh, put quite a few of them up on our, on our monitor. And I think the first, uh, the first uh, uh, photo that we have on the monitor tonight is of, uh, of your, great, your grandfather, grandfather, Robert Dickey Cranston. And uh, also, uh, I think we have another photo of one of uh, his Victorians. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Well, I, th I think we can bring that up on the monitor uh, now. There it is. Yeah, that's, that's the house that my parents were married in. Oh, it is? That was one of their houses oh. that they lived in. Now, what about your parents, uh, Eleanor? Their, your mother and father both born in California? Both, both born in California. My father in Yountville, which sounds like little Abner, <laughs> and <laughs> my mother in Sacramento, where <clears throat> her father was a prominent physician. And so uh, how did they meet? Father and mother met at Stanford <clears throat> in something called Mrs. North's Boarding House. It was a very special boarding house set up by Senator Phelan for a friend of his who had been widowed. So they met there. I think we have uh, a couple of, of early photographs of your, your parents, uh, William and Carol, uh, coming up on the screen right now. Uh, very handsome, very, very uh, energetic looking people. They, they look like they had a lot of life. My mother was really very pretty, prettier than, than that picture. And also there's a, a wonderful picture of them on the Stanford uh, campus. I think that we can bring that up on the ma monitor as well. It looks like uh, your mother is uh, stepping off of a, a, of a style. A style. They're, they're, isn't that a wonderful picture? Yes. I she love was her, quite small. I love her hat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you were born in Palo Alto. And uh, I, I know that uh, your, your family, you said your father uh, had uh, lost his fortune in the earthquake? Well, it wasn't a fortune. They, they, there were hard times in those yes. days in San Francisco. 
but <clears throat> he started out in the real estate business. He'd meant to be a lawyer, but when he fell in love with my mother, he had to give up that ambition, and, and he went into real estate with his father. But the earthquake and fire of 1906 burned the city, and, he, and they lost everything they had except their personal possessions in a flat that they were renting. So they started over again in Palo Alto, probably in what's now East Palo Alto, and they lived on a farm. My father milked a cow, and tended vegetables, and began to sell real estate from the seat of a bicycle. And that's where you were born, as well as your well, brother? Well, no, we, we then got a house on Copper Street, oh. where I was born, and Alan was born too. And I remember, that's my earliest memory, the day that he was born, when I was four. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. But then, uh, after uh, living a few years in Palo Alto, your, your family decided to move to Los Altos. Yes, it was the same year that Alan was born that they bought the farm that they called the Red Barn because of a wonderful old red barn on it. And it was the Windbigler Hill, which most people around here are familiar with yes. because it's a gray French chateau sitting up on the top of a hill. And it was a wonderful place with 13 acres of orchard, apricots and apples and prunes, three different orchards, and a wonderful view of the hills just like the one behind us, uh, nothing, no houses, just, just hills, and the same on the other side, beautiful open country all the way to the bay. Oh, that's marvelous. Now, I think we're bringing up uh, a picture of that red barn on the monitor now. Uh, that's, that's the home, and, and you said, you, you told me in an earlier conversation that you thought perhaps uh, Gilbert Smith was, uh, may have been the uh, carpenter on this home. I think so, because it was very similar to History House. It, it had the same dormer windows, mm -hmm. stone fireplace, and a winding staircase that went up behind the stone fireplace right. to two bedrooms upstairs, and it had beaver board and wooden floors, lots and lots, lots of similarities. Lots of similarities to History yes. House. Now, I think we have another picture coming up soon of uh, Eleanor and uh, Alan on a, on a horse, one of your plow horses <laughs> on, at the Red Barn. It's a wonderful picture of you, Eleanor. It was also our buggy horse, and the only way we had to get anywhere was in a horse and buggy. So we used to go down to Los Altos that way. And when we were on the hill, we were often marooned in the, in the wintertime when there was a lot of rain, and the creek, of, the creek would flood, and we would look down in this spreading lake of brown water, and no, we couldn't get off our hill for days. Oh, I know. And then you said the Adobe Creek was a raging torrent in those days. It That's, was. That it ran all the year round. Isn't that unbelievable? Yeah. And I, I think the last picture we have in this set is of the, the Windbigler estate as it looks today. Um, and that's what you can see off of Fremont uh, Road if you uh, go up towards uh, um, the, the, the Los Altos Hills uh, um, courthouse, or the Civic Center there, isn't it? That's right. It's right on that road. It's yeah. a, we had a beautiful view of the valley. It was just filled with orchards, and it was just as open and empty as, as the scene behind right. us. Now, how long did you live at the Red Barn? About eight years. Eight years. and. and uh, th those must have been happy years because you were a young girl at that time. And uh, do you have any special memories about uh, those those times? And well, I remember some hair-raising adventures <laughs> <laughs> because <clears throat> there was a time when when we went to when I was allowed to go down to Los Altos in the horse and buggy with with our hired man who was part Indian driving, oh, wow. and we were going down. Fremont Road from the Windbigler Hill, which which was then our home, and my father and his partner had bought a car for the for the business, and they came. I think it was perhaps about the first time they'd been out in it, and they came along the road, and there we met, right near the corner of Edith and Fremont, and they asked me if I would like to ride in the car, and of course I said yes. So I started to dismount, and they'd left the engine running, I guess because they were so proud of it, but it scared the horse, and the horse bolted, and I was thrown down under the wheels and run over by the buggy. Oh, no. And taken home <laughs> in my father's arms, wailing, and to great shock of my mother. The trouble's on the frontier, huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, from there, 
I know your father uh, was a realtor uh, in town, isn't that correct? That's right. And so he, uh, he had other plans for the family. He, you know, there was a move afoot, I understand. Uh, it, so the next family move was to? He, he and his partner had sometimes bought property and sold it. And so they bought this place down uh, at the bottom of the hill <clears throat> between the creek and what was then the railroad tracks. The railroad tracks ran along what's now the Foothill Expressway. Yes. And uh, they, fell, they, they bought the place, planning to sell it again, and they divided up the furniture. It had some nice antiques in it. And then my father and mother fell more and more in love with it. So they bought it from the company and moved down there and brought the furniture back to its rightful places. And what did you call this, this home? Call, it was called Villa Warwick, which was made up of our initials, W for William and A for Alan, RE for me, Ruth Eleanor, and C for Carol. Oh, yes. So uh, I think we have a, a picture on our monitor now. We're going to be bringing it up of, uh, of Villa Warwick. There yeah, it is. Yeah, I think nowadays there's about five houses on that lawn. I know. I have, yeah. a, I have a friend who lives on that street, and it's hard to sort of get a perspective about how glorious it must have been in, in those days. And I think we also have some aerial views of Villa Warwick. Um, uh, I think they're bringing it up on the monitor, and where you can actually see uh, the, uh, uh, the the little ranch house in the in the far corner. And you said that actually that may have been a very old Spanish uh, adobe. Well, it it was a frame house, but that and a shed nearby went back to much earlier times, to the times of Juan Prado Mesa, who had the earliest land grant of 4,000 acres. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I think there's one final aerial view that we have in this set uh, that shows the, uh, the train tracks, which is now the Foothill Expressway. You sort of can get a feeling of how unpopulated the Los Altos area was at that, that time. That was our place on the far side of the tracks, oh. bounded by Adobe Creek, Creek, which ran all the year round then. And we used to fish there and sw dam it up and swim in it. Oh. It was wonderful having that creek. Now I understand that you went to school in, uh, Pal in Palo Alto, uh, Castilea School, and that you met your future husband uh, there. Well, that, that's true. His sister, Louise, was my best friend at Castilea. She was a boarder. And Jack, my future husband, was away at school. But he came back to live in the house that his parents were building in Los Altos and to go to Stanford. And he would drive Louise into Castellet, and so they picked me up and took me in too. And uh, my mother used to laugh about, she would lean out the window and wave goodbye to me and I would get in the back seat, but one day the front door was open for me and Louise had been put in the back seat. Oh, so and different was, status, huh? So, <laughs> you know, you had gone up in the world. Yes, a romance had begun. <laughs> oh, that's exciting. So uh, I think we have a, a picture of uh, both uh, you and, uh, uh, oh, that's a picture of, uh, of your mother and, and dad at Villa Warwick. Yes. Yeah, we forgot to show that from the last set. But uh, the next pictures up should be of, uh, of uh, Eleanor and Jack. Uh, and right before you were married or at the time that you were married. So let's, uh, let's bring that up now. Wonderful pictures of, uh, of both of you. Now, I understand that your uh, husband was an engineer? Yes, he was a mechanical engineer. And during, after we were married, we lived in Oakland. And when World War I, World War II started, he, uh, was given a job at Joshua Handy Ironworks to design a, to design a diesel engine for the Navy. And uh, so we moved down to Los Altos again temporarily. We just built a house in Piedmont that was our dream house. <clears throat> but we came down and rented a house from the Darwin Tealets. And then we began to fall in love with Los Altos again. So we decided to stay. And we had a chance to buy the Edinburgh place where we've lived ever since. It was on Fremont Road, now Old Trace Lane, and uh, near the corner of Fremont and Arastradero, a wonderful Spanish house. 
and it was then a chicken farm with about 10 long chicken houses and all kinds of other outbuildings. And so my first project was to start getting rid of all the buildings because <laughs> I didn't want to be in the chicken business. And there I was during the war, unable to get any help at all with two infants and this big place to run. And I really had my hands full. Oh, that's, that's a great story. And I know that um, your family has been very, very interested in politics, that your father uh, uh, was, did some political work uh, uh, in, in Los Altos and, and also in Palo Alto, I understand. But your brother, Alan Cranston, uh, showed interest in politics at a very early age. Uh, how did that all begin? Eleanor? Well, I, my father was always interested in politics. He was, was a president of the Republican Club in Palo Alto in the early days. I, I think guess there's around. a story here between wh how, how this family became, <laughs> came from Republican roots, Democratic roots. Yeah, that's <laughs> right, yes. And, uh, and he also was chair, my father was chairman of the, of the War Work Council when World War I began. I, and we remember World War I. There was a camp called Camp Fremont on the Page Mill Road, where it's now the corner of Foothill Expressway and the Page Mill. And the soldiers used to set off explosions. And we'd hear them and think the war was coming close to home. Oh. And, uh, but how did Alan get interested well, Alan, in politics? Alan, we, we'd heard a lot about politics all our lives. My father used to read the letter I digest aloud at night to the whole family. <clears throat> and uh, then once Alan, when he was about 20, I guess, was in uh, sightseeing in Washington, and he went into the Senate and sat in the gallery and became absolutely enthralled. And from then on, his ambition for life was to get into the Senate, but he had a long way to go, and he had to form a rebuild the Democratic Party in yes. California. People say he was lost in the wilderness for a long, long time before. Years, probably. For years, until the time was ripe for the Democrats to, uh, to, to take office. They'd been out of office for a long time, but uh, they were swept in. Pat Brown became governor, and Allen became state controller. He wanted to run for the Senate, but it was suggested that he was young and inexperienced. So Claire Engel ran for the Senate, and Ellen ran for controller, and they were all elected. It was now, a sweep. Now, were you um, involved in politics yourself at those, in not, those not years? A, no, not in those years. I was too busy with the children still, and my, I had a counselor because I seemed to need one to figure out these teenagers, even in those days, and she advised me to stay home and not get immersed in politics, which I regret. Oh, but I did it They later. wouldn't give you that kind of advice today. <laughs> no, that's true. They wouldn't. <laughs> but I, I got into it later, and uh, somebody suggested that I run for a local office, which I did. And that, then they suggested that I run for Northern California Women's Chairman of the state party. And then they suggested I run for state women's chairman, which I did, and I was elected. And then I did that for about 10 or more years and built up something called... And this a, is all the while that Alan was in the Senate? No, that was before uh, he was in oh, the before Senate. Oh, before he was in the Senate. And uh, he, was, he was controller, but then he lost when Reagan made a sweep of the state, and the Democrats were all defeated, including Alan and Pat Brown. But I was still there, and that was when I became women's chairman of the party and uh, active in many, many campaigns and on the... On the uh, steering committee of a lot of campaigns, I and then later Allen's. And, and then later his campaigns. Mm -hmm. you, were, you started to get active in politicking with him. Yes. I think we have a, a picture coming up on the monitor now of the, the, uh, the celebration um, after the 1968 election. That's that was a wonderful night. My husband is there behind Allen. Oh, I see him there. And there you are with Allen. Yeah, everyone looks radiant. We were very excited. Yes. And we also have a picture of uh, Eleanor, of you at that time. I guess this must have been taken when you were a uh, uh, Democratic chairwoman. Um, was that about that That's time? That's right. That was then. Lovely picture of you. 
Now, I understand that uh, while uh, Alan was um, in the Senate, you traveled with him. Uh, and you've, you've had quite a few adventures which you'd like to share with us. Well, that was, that was a wonderful thing, going places with Alan. He was very good about taking us along at our own expense. <laughs> he, we always hastened to add. Yeah. But uh, we, because of his being in the Senate, we generally met with heads of state and leading figures in the government. And one of the most, and, and in Russia, for instance, we were given tours of the Kremlin and taken to see Tolstoy's house. But the most fascinating trip was one to the Middle East where, where we met with Begin in his office and Sadat in his villa oh. and King Hussein in his palace. Oh, what wonderful experiences. What amazing. Yes. Now, I know that um, your first husband also uh, was a uh, in politics, he, uh, he, uh, he was the second mayor of Los Altos Hills. That was my first husband, first husband Jack Fowl. Jack Fowl, yes. And he, um, so you must have been also involved with local politics. Yes, um, that's true. We had many, many bitter fights in Los Altos Hills that have been going on ever since. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing, nothing much changes, does nothing, it? Nothing much changes. I know. So um, I know that, uh, you, uh, you lost your first husband and uh, met uh, a man that had been a part of your life in, on the fringes. Uh, and what? Well, he, we had the same friends. We happened to miss each other at Stanford just because of circumstances. And, his, and this is Don. Don Cameron. Cameron. He, uh, he left for a couple of years to <clears throat> help out his family, and I left to get married. So we missed each other, but we were practically in the same class. And uh, he had an interesting life as a writer for Metro Golden Mayor when he first got out of Stanford, and then as a documentary filmmaker for the State Department. Very interesting person that I, I think I w was lucky to have 66 years of happy married life between the two. Lucky you. <laughs> I know we have a, a, Eleanor was able to uh, find this, this, this photograph. I thought maybe the, the camera could pick that up uh, of uh, she and Don. There they are. Handsome couple. <laughs> that shows up well. Yes, it's a nice picture. Great, thank you. Now I know, um, Eleanor, that you have had uh, a writing career as well as a, a, a political career. Uh, you, you established a friendship with uh, uh, Wally Stegner, one of your neighbors, and uh, can you tell, what can you tell us about that? Well, the, the Stegners were dear, dear friends who lived near us, and uh, we have met them because we all had horses in those days. That was, well, during the war, and that was when we met, that was the only good way to get around because gasoline was rationed. So we started a trails club, and we used to ride up in Hidden Villa and all over the hills together. And that was how this friendship started. But then Wally later on let me into his creative writing class at Stanford, and, and that led to my writing the biography of Alan, which is now still available down at Heinzelman's. This is the, uh, the book that Eleanor wrote about her brother Alan. And as you said, it's available down at Heinzelmann, so it's still available. I'd, I'd like to make one comment about the difference in Los Altos now. When we were children, it was just one wide main street yes. with about five stores and hitching posts on each side. And we would ride, we would walk to town or else ride down on, the, on a plow horse. And now mm. what, what it's like. And you, I remember you telling me about uh, uh, when you lived at the, at the, the Villa Warwick, you had, a, you had saddle horses then, and that you used to gallop down Los Altos Avenue. That was, that was a great treat, because the horse loved to run, and I did too, and the, it was just a wonderful, long, empty dirt road. So we would just, the horse would get more and more excited as we got to Los Altos Avenue, and then I would just let the reins loose, and he would just tear from one end to the other. Now, do you think that Los Altos has, um, has, has changed drastically? Do you see remnants of it from your days uh, as a child, or 
Do you, don't you recognize it at all? It's just unrecognizable. When we looked out from the hill at the Red Barn, we looked out on the most beautiful view in the world. Not only the view of the hills, like behind us, yes. absolutely empty, but on the other side, empty too, all the way to the bay, the scalloping of orchards, and almost no buildings at all. People would come down from San Francisco when they began to have cars and drive through the valley and enjoy the orchards blossoming in the spring. I know, I heard that that was a glorious time. Uh, well, this has been, I can't believe how quickly this time has gone by, Eleanor. I, I appreciate you coming to share your very, very rich life with us tonight. Um, I wish there were there were more times so we could go into the more of the stories. I know you you have have a lot of them, and maybe sometime you'll come back and and share some more of them. I would really, really would really like that. I want to thank you, uh, our viewers, for uh, tuning in tonight, and I hope that you've enjoyed this show and that you'll join us the next time. <laughs>